Check one. Ch -ch -ch Check one. Hello. Welcome to Comic Book Herald Live. Hey, everybody. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor in chief of comicbookherald.com. A few minutes late today. I got to be honest, it was more important to me to finish my pizza than it was to start three minutes earlier. And listen, if that's a problem, you can, you can shove it. <laughs> Starting real aggressively. Real weird this week. Thanks for joining. I really appreciate you being here. But listen, we're going all honesty. We're going all honesty. We're going full transparency all the time. I've got nothing to hide. I've got no secrets anymore, man. Let's just do this. Let's just be real with each other, right? <laughs> Let's do it. Mostly we're going to talk about comics. Um, I think probably everyone listening can can also prioritize pizza. I think that's totally fair. Uh, but yeah, mostly we're going to talk about comics today. We got a, just a loaded, loaded week from Marvel. Real stacked deck. So we're going to talk about what came out today, of course. If you are here live, get your questions and thoughts in in the chat. I will address as many of them as I can. The other thing that I want to see, okay, the other thing I want to see today, I've got interviews coming up this week with Victor Laval, writer of Sabretooth, and now Sabretooth and the Exiles. Sabretooth and the Exiles, number one, came out today. That interview is this week. If you got questions for Victor Laval, get them in in the chat. If I see some good ones, I will grab them and credit you and ask them in the interview, time permitting. Okay, so we'll take some fan questions there. We can also just kind of address sorts of things you might be curious to talk about there. And then in... Let's see, about 11 days, we're going to be doing a CBH Live interview with Kieran Gillen, the writer of Judgment Day, of Immortal X-Men, of Eternals, and today's Judgment Day Omega. Okay, so get in any questions or thoughts on, on the stream here, and I'll pull those questions in. And again, time permitting, we'll get to as many as I can. Um, usually, interviews, I, I have time for maybe two, maybe three the best of the best, right? So if you got a cream of the crop question, one that I think is really good, I'll try to get to them at the end. I was able to do this with James um, DeMatteis recently, our interview we had this past weekend, and uh, and a couple with Ed Brubaker interview I had a couple days ago with just a, a preposterously generous individual, <laughs> Ed Brubaker, right? like one of just absolutely my favorite comic writers straight up of all time gave me like two hours of his time. Just could not, could not believe it. Absolutely incredible. Um, and I'm excited for that interview to be published. That'll be here on the Comic Book Herald channel. Uh, we'll publish the video, you know, and it'll also be up on the podcast as well. Um, the podcast, the Comic Book Herald podcast, it's either search for Comic Book Herald, uh, search for best comics ever, probably either name should work. Um, but that's where you can find the interviews. Now I am, let's see, interview number 98 came out this week. That was J.M.D. Mateus, writer of Craven's Last Hunt and Justice League International and just a ridiculous quantity of amazing comics as well. Um, so that means we're coming up on number 100. I think the way the timing's going to shake out, I think the way the timing's going to shake out is Kieran Gillen live is going to be, is going to go out as my number 100. I think I can time it that way. And then I think it's going to be like a back-to-back -back then Ed Brubaker 101. I don't know. It could go either or. And like, I feel weird. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not going to do a live rank of like, who do I like more? Who gave the better interview? It's really just like a, it's a, it's a 100 interview, mega spectacular that can't be contained by one episode, I think is the way we have to look at it. But then it's like, I got James DeMatteis, I got Victor Laval on here coming to talk. Just like, cannot believe my luck with, with individuals willing to talk to me. Um, and, uh, and talk comics. It's just, listen, like, is it bragging to say anyone who's anyone has been on the CBH interview show at this point? No, it's not. It's just a fact. <laughs> so like, honestly, if you're a comics creator and you haven't, um, haven't joined for an interview, are you a comics creator? We, we have to ask the questions. We have to ask the questions here. Uh, but in the meantime, we can talk about uh, what you all got in the chat here and, of course, the comics today. I'm seeing Best Channel, Love from Paris, France. Hey, thanks for joining. Appreciate you being here. Man, Paris, France, it's got to be. Let's see. I, I record the My Marvelous Year podcast with Charlotte Fierro, who is based in that region. And I'm going to guess it's like, let's see. Let's do a little time travel here. It's got to be like, what, like one in the morning or something, right? One, two in the morning in Paris? 
unless I'm like just way off the mark. Um, the good on you being up talking comics. Love it. Love it. That is, listen, I'm only up at one or two because one of the kids woke up yelling about something. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'm and I'm grumpy that I got to be up, but you got to do it, right? So, okay. Let's focus. Let's focus. We got a question here. Ask Mr. Laval if he's sitting on the title expats for his part three of the Sabretooth Saga after... <laughs> I like that. Expats. That's really good. That's really good. That would actually make a ton of sense. All right. We might have to toss that one his way. Um, and then we can say we called it first. I'm definitely going to be bragging in that interview that I called a Victor Laval written Sabretooth. I'm just assuming before anyone. Like, I was I was months, months ahead of the curve on that announcement. Um, and, and hopefully he'll sit there patiently while I do that. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm also seeing Dave. I just want to say I see you putting in the work with CBH site and getting those creators on interviews. We see you grinding. Thank you, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It is actually a lot of work, is the thing. Um, running a little website. And again, this is all, this is all job two stuff. You know, I got a day job. Um, but definitely, definitely it's a lot of fun and it's a great time. And, uh, the interview stuff, I don't know, like I, I probably could make it easier on myself, honestly, if I wanted to. Uh, but I, I feel some sense of responsibility and also just, it's more enjoyable to me to like dive into their work and read everything that they've done and all the stuff that they're name checking is influences and stuff like that. Um, you know, like it's, and, and then it just winds up being like, like Victor Laval, I saw like tweeted that he was like, Andor is a good show. I haven't watched it yet. So then I'm like, okay, I should watch that. Right. So it's just like, it's all just like encouragement to like do fun things and push myself to do them <laughs> just in a priority order. But then you gotta make time for all that stuff, right? You gotta make time for all that. And I gotta make time for dancing with the stars. My greatest guilty pleasure watching with my wife. It's like, how do you, and that show is long. That show was way too long. I'll tell you that for free. <laughs> right? The burdens. The burdens of the privileged. Um, no, no, it's all great. And things are going good here. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's do this. Let's do this. Sabretooth and the Exiles, Judgment Day Omega, Wolverine number 27, Legion of X number 6, uh, I think another one, Marauders number 8. All the books that came out today that are kind of in the usual wheelhouse. I also read... Fantastic Four number one, a new number one issue on the FF series, written by Ryan North. We got our by Even Coelho. Apologies for mispronunciation on that. And what else did I read? I read Venom number 13 because it is a prelude kickoff to Dark Web, which of course has Limbo and Goblin Queen stuff that has been teased for some time now. So we got a few directions we could go. I think I'm actually just going to start with Fantastic Four. I'm not going to go super in-depth on it. I don't think there's a ton to go in-depth on other than to say I had a good time with it. I really like Ryan North as a creator. Obviously, I was saying earlier, if you're anyone, you've been on the CBH interview show, Ryan North has, um, of course. And it's it's he's awesome, writes great comics. Uh, the adaptation of Slaughterhouse-Five was just like out of this world good, uh, which is a really hard thing to pull off. But it's it's a nice framing of what this series potentially can be and kind of what it's been pitched as, which is just like kind of like one-offish adventures of various members of the cast. There's clearly going to be an overarching connective tissue of something Reed's done that has caused some trouble. I won't say any more about it than that. But like this first issue is a Ben and Alicia story and something weird happens. And it's kind of like it's kind of taken Fantastic Four and maybe thinking about them a little more in like a Doctor Who-ish angle of just like, hey, these characters can go anywhere and do anything practically. Um, let's just tell those stories and have fun with it as opposed to trying to build some massive grand tapestry. I guess trying to play the Jonathan Hickman game necessarily, you know, because that era of, of kind of that style of comics, I feel like is fading in a lot of ways at the big two, right? In in many, many ways. Not always, but sometimes. Um, and you're just not guaranteed that much rope, you know? You're just not guaranteed that much runway for a story. So I enjoyed it. I think it was a good first issue. Nothing like super spectacular about it, but I'm eager to see where this series goes. So I'm a Fantastic Four fan. Um, I don't, you know, they're not my go-tos, but like I... I like more Fantastic Four runs than Avengers runs, for example. So, like, I'm eager to see it be good again because I was not 
invested in the Dan Slott era. Um, I didn't enjoy it. It never clicked for me. And I hope it's good again. Because, like, honestly, at the end of the day, Fantastic Four comics exist to give us good Doctor Doom stories. And that can only really happen within the scope of a good Fantastic Four run, you know? So we kind of need them to be good, right? I'm thinking of the Hickman era. I'm thinking of Wade and Raringo. I'm thinking of John Byrne in the 80s. And, of course, Stan and Jack, right? The creators of it all. So the better Fantastic Four is, the better off we are, because that means good Doom content. And all hail Doom. And all hail Doom. Okay, but that's my Fantastic Four thoughts. If you got questions, thoughts there, get them in the chat. We'll talk about that, all right? Um, I'm senior from Kenji. Hope to talk a little bit about FF, but also would love your thoughts on the current Venom run as a whole. Okay, so let's just do all the non-X stuff first. Um, I cannot get into this Venom run. It feels like a run I should love. Like, on paper, we got Rom V. We got Al Ewing. We got them passing the baton. Coming off the heels of a really interesting Venom run by Donny Cates and Ryan Stegman. And it is not clicking for me at all. <laughs> like, Al Ewing is, I mean, probably my favorite writer at Marvel right now. Um, you know, it's again, it's that 1A, 1B thing with Gillen on, on Eternals and, and Immortal X-Men. Um, and then you got Ron V, who's written some of my favorite comics of the last three, four years. The Savage Shores, over at DC, The Swamp Thing was amazing recently. Um, Blue and Green from Vault was just an excellent, excellent work. Uh, you just have these incredible creators. And then you have this series that is like, it's bouncing between semi-grounded looks at Dylan, who's the son of Eddie Brock, per the Cates and Stegman run. And then you have Eddie Brock's super cosmic stuff with Ewing. And just like in a vacuum, if you told me, first off, how we got into that vacuum, because that's confusing. I would like some help getting out, right? But you can help me get out. And then you told me Ewing's writing a massive cosmic rendition of Venom following on the heels of the cosmic sort of mythology of King and Black. I'd be like, that's got to be one of the best Marvel comics. And it does not work for me at all. I don't know. I, it might be a me thing. It might be a me thing. But it's just like I, I does like Ewing cosmic stuff. I tend to love X-Men Red, probably my favorite comic right now. Um, what Ewing's doing on Defenders Beyond, massive cosmic stuff, always very engaging. I enjoy reading those issues. On Venom, I just, I don't know, it's not hitting. Um, I read today's issue, same thing, same thing, honestly. It is really just a Venom issue, right? And then at the very end, it sort of sets the scene for like why Venom would be in limbo and why Eddie Brock would encounter Madeline Pryor, who is the current restored as the Goblin Queen, for the pages of New Mutants, is the ruler of Limbo, it seems, and is concocting some sort of scheme with Ben Riley, who is back to, uh, or founding, yeah, back to uh, his bad guy roots. Not roots, I guess, his, his bad guy turn. Uh, he seems to be in the, I tried, this got messed up, screw everyone mode, uh, post Zeb Wells' Amazing Spider-Man, right? So, yeah, I don't know, I just, like, it, it felt like, I was like, okay, Venom's going to be on my best Marvel Comics of 2022 list on CBH. That feels like a no-brainer. And at no point have I been able to um, get it there. <laughs> just doesn't do it for me. But, like, if you're loving it, like, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not surprised by that. Like, these are incredible creators. Um, I actually like, really like Brian Hitch on the book, too, honestly. Um, I think Brian Hitch is... Uh, so obviously super famous for doing Ultimates with Mark Miller and The Authority with Warren Ellis, right? That was like, you know, massive kind of comics landscape defining art. Um, it's kind of bounced around since, but in recent years, like did amazing work on Hawkman. That was a pretty underrated DC series. And uh, and and now on Venom. Like I, I like the stylings on it. I've got no problem with it there. But, you know, just not, not clicking for me. Not clicking for me. And that'll happen. That'll happen. But if you're loving it, good for you. Good for you. I am intrigued by Dark Web. I mean, I do, I do still, again, like I, we talked about this, I think probably last week with the, the free comic book day cover where it's like cap and the X-Men and it's, you know, what I talked about then is like, okay, my prediction for a while now has been all of the Marvel universe is going to 
pull into the X-Men. Like the X-Men are like a black hole, right? Gravitational center. And everything in the Marvel Universe is going to come into their orbit because they're the most interesting and most exciting thing. And everything happening with Krakoa is the biggest stuff in the Marvel Universe. Like if you're looking for a through line, if you're looking for a center of Marvel Comics over the last three years, it's X-Men stuff. It's Krakoa, right? And the rest of the Marvel Universe is, is very clear in catching up on this. Spider-Man's getting pulled in in a dark web event. The Avengers are getting pulled in in Judgment Day, and it looks like free comic book day stuff, maybe with an Uncanny Avengers series getting announced. Um, and on it, I think that's a good thing. I do think that's a good thing because the Marvel Universe needs a center. It needs a core, and stuff is... You can then get... And Zeb Wells is smart enough to do this. He's coming off Hel Hellions. He was in the Krakoa office. Like, you get a boost. You get a, a sense of importance and of stakes by connecting to whatever the through line of the Marvel Universe is. Um, and I think that's that's going to mean Dark Web is at least interesting, and then it's going to mean Sins of Sinister, of course, as being a very X-focused Mr. Sinister thing. Um, I have super high hopes for I have super high hopes for So let's see. I'm seeing here in the super chat. Thanks for uh, doing that. Very, very much appreciated. Amazing Spider-Man just did a Hobgoblin mystery arc. I have not read it yet. I'm behind on the Hobgoblin. I'll read it before I dive into uh, Dark Web with the Amazing Spider-Man connections there. Um, I, I, we've talked a little bit about the Wells run before. Uh, it's kind of middle of the road for me. It was never, I was intrigued, but it was, it wasn't like blowing me away or anything. I'll check out this Hobgoblin arc and maybe share some thoughts once I've done that. Um, okay. Let's dive into the comics. Sabretooth and the Exiles. Let's start here again, because we got the, the Laval interview coming this week, which I'm excited to do. This follows up on the five issue mini Sabretooth, which ran earlier this year. It's one of my favorite comics of the year. Full stop, one of my favorite Marvel books, but also just one of my favorite comics. It was smart, it was connected to the X-Men continuity, and it made for a great read uh, with Victor Duvall, Leonard Kirk, Rainbow Rado, and the team. Exiles picks up where Sabretooth has escaped Krakoa. He busts out of the pit, and not only does he bust out of the pit, but all of the exiled mutants, of which there were like seven, I think. Originally there were five. Then Nanny and Orphan Maker get thrown in there, and Toad as well. Um, Nanny and Orphan Maker, that happened in the pages of Hellions. Toad, it happens in Trial of Magneto. They all bust out as well, and they're on a, hey, Victor uh, screwed us over mission. You know, they're on a mission sort of of revenge with Sabretooth, and, and that's where we start things. So it's pretty much hot on the heels of where Sabretooth 5 left off, which also left us with, or like Sabretooth busts out, and then he's immediately captured by this Orcus research base, which we learned here in issue number one is experimenting on mutants um, in, in efforts to sort of benefit science for mankind. Uh, not only are they experimenting on mut mutants, but like there are mass graves. Like they are, are murdering tons of mutants in the process. Uh, Laval makes a surprising but interesting connection here where Dr. Barrington who is a character in Orcus player who I think was introduced in Children of the Atom, um, who did not expect to see here again, is, is kind of the main evil scientist of sorts, right? And Laval, as should be expected um, through the novels and now through the comics work, makes some scathing and important connections in terms of looking at, like, he has this doctor, this, this white woman, talking about the horrors of black women being experimented on essentially in the foundations of gynecology, right? That I guess the history of gynecology of this doctor who's like considered the founder of the medium that he experimented on slaves, you know, against their will, right? Conducted all these experiments without anesthesia, just torturous, torturous stuff. And then once he had, you know, figured it out, then brought gynecology with anesthesia, BT dubs, right? To the masses. Um, and he has Dr. Barrington reflecting on that and you would, th and like saying the right things, <laughs> right? In terms of not being a monster and being like, yeah, that's bad. Um, but then at the end of the data page, turning around and being like, so the problem here is actually that you just need someone who isn't human and that's mutants and just expressing those, those exact prejudices and sort of monstrous instincts, but just reapplied to mutant kind here, right, in terms of these horrific experiments, which apparently are creating mass graves of mutant kind. Um, this is where I think Sabretooth is super interesting because it's this book which is playing with incredibly 
C tier, D tier unknown characters, with the exception of Sabretooth himself, right? Who is, is Sabretooth an A-list villain? That's probably fair, right? I mean, longtime arch enemy of Wolverine. Do we give him A tier or is he B tier? I'm going to go A tier, A minus tier. Okay, not important. <laughs> but the point is, it's focusing on all these mutants that like, you go down the street, most people aren't going to know them. You know, you talk to even uh, comics readers. Most of them are not going to be like, oh yeah, Mole. Big mole guy. <laughs> know a ton about mole's history. And yet, a major player in this book. Uh, and that's where Sabretooth and Excel starts. You know, talking about there are the heroes of the story, and then there are, you know, the bit players. And this is the story of the bit players, you know, the underserved, the, the understoried of sorts, you know? And it's telling that story, but it's doing it with ramifications that are massive, in this era and for like everything we read, right? Everything that happened in Sabretooth was massively relevant in terms of how we think about Krakoa, in terms of how we think about that whole society, in terms of how we think about Professor X and Magneto, right? All that stuff is there on the page because we really get to see, okay, who is this nation actually for? We said it's for all mutants, is it actually? The answer is no, clearly. You know, and you see the failings and you see the flaws and you see the cracks emphasized in some really effective ways. Um, in the Exiles, we now have characters who have those lessons, who have had the promise of a mutant nation completely spoiled, right, by their experiences being thrown in the pit. For ver Like, for Sabretooth is one of those things where you read House of X and Powers of Ten, and it's, it's the way Hickman writes it. It's like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> like, like the way, like it seems harsh, but it's also like, well, what else are you going to do with Sabretooth? You kind of can't be worrying about him. You know, it presents it in that way. It does. Um, the rest of the mutants though, in Sabretooth, the, the main, the first five issue series, there's a real sense of like, wait, they got thrown in the pit for that? They got thrown in the pit for that? They barely did anything. You know, not all of them, not all of them, but some of them. You know, and you just see the the fallacy of Professor X as the savior mutant, which, are like, of course we know if you've been reading comics through this era, or really at any point, <laughs> like non, non-90s, you know, Savior's era, uh, Xavier related, you know, like, you know, but it really highlights it and says, like, yeah, this is, this pit <laughs> is a problem. It is a problem. Let's talk about that. And that's what the book does, and it does it very effectively. Um, okay, so Exiles is, is I think, it's not as clear as, like, a manifesto of sorts, you know? It's not as clear to me in terms of, like, okay, this is the prison commentary book, you know? Which is an oversimplification. But it's not as clear in this first issue. It feels more like a comic book sequel. But in some very fun ways. We get here, I think Laval gets to flex a little bit more. You know, it's it's less in the head of Victor Creed and all that psychology and that work, which had to be done up front to sort of establish Laval's perspective, which is that Sabretooth is awful. And we are not going to give him an out on that, which is really tempting. Many books have done it. <laughs> you know, there's a whole era before House and Powers, where Sabretooth is literally repositioned as a good guy, post-Axis, right? He inverts from evil to good and basically becomes bulkier Wolverine for a number of years. It never works for me. Never, never, never. Okay? And, and Laval was smart enough, I think, to see through that and say, like, no, Victor Creed is horrible. <laughs> Top to bottom. Okay? The system's still wrong. The system's still wrong, you know? What do you do with the people who are horrible top to bottom? What are the right answers? Who's it for? These are interesting questions, okay? Sabretooth in the Exiles is less about, like, what are these big questions? And again, more about, like, well, what is the story here? And now Laval gets to play with the interactions between Necra and Oya, between Nanny and Orpha Maker, getting in that Hellion's humor, which I, I didn't necessarily expect, but was pretty delighted to see again. Because Zeb Wells established both of them as pretty funny characters. We have really interesting new characters, or characters who even feel new 
Like, Melter existed technically, but I've never read a Melter comic. Well, the original Melter, but not this guy, this kid. Fake Johnny Storm, <laughs> you know? You got Third Eye, who's like super fascinating new character creation. Um, and, and again, and then you've got um, uh, Toad, obviously, who has a, you know, original Brotherhood of Evil Mutant. Okay? So you've got a really interesting oddball crew. The book winds up, and not, not just because of Nanny and Orphan Maker, but certainly in part, like, it's got a Hellions vibe. You know, it's got that vibe of, hey, we don't have the major players here, but that means we can be weirder, we can be funnier, we can be more surprising with what we're doing with these players because there's, lo like, there's limited expectations, you know? Like, if you're telling a story with Wolverine, you can't generally go too far outside the box because Wolverine has to go back in that box at some point. If you're telling a story with Necra and Madison Jeffries, there's no box. There's no expectations. You can basically do anything, okay? Um, and I think that's part of what makes these books so interesting and so exciting at times. Now, one of the big kind of X-Men-focused questions that Sabretooth and the Exiles asks is, it's been hinted at strongly through Hellions and throughout comics history that Orphan Maker, you know, this psychologically young boy, very reliant on Nanny, but who in Hellions kind of starts developing into like at least some sort of like adolescent resistance, um, that his mutant power is actually devastating and that he wears a containment suit 24-7 because if his mutant power got out, it would be devastating. And the first thing that happens here in this first issue, and this is going to be spoilers if you haven't read it, so, you know, mute or whatever for two minutes if you don't want to know. But I recommend you read the comics. Um, he, he's captured by Dr. Barrington. And this, I don't even know, creation, this Frankenstein of sorts um, that Dr. Barrington has created. Victor the Wall also did a really cool comics miniseries called uh, The Destroyer from Boom Studios, which is a riff on Frankenstein, on the original novel. It's really good. It's interesting as, as kind of commentary. Um, but Peter has been captured, Peter, a.k.a. Orphan Maker, and what we are, what the threat is now is what if his power gets out there? What if this is replicated and used by Dr. Barrington? Nanny says that it would end life on Earth. It's that level of power. You know, so we're talking some sort of nuclear explosion. We're talking, I don't know, some sort of unstoppable plague. Like, it is it is massive. And we've never seen it, and we've never had it defined. And that's kind of a surprise, interesting thing to potentially be getting here. So, yeah, I'm super in on this mini. Definitely on the back of what was one of my favorite comics of the year. I think if, you know, if this was the first issue in in the run, I'd be like, it's a wait and see. You know, I don't know where this is going. But because it's coming out of something so strong, I mean, I'm all in. I'm all in, and I definitely want to see it. But definitely um, get in your thoughts, get in your questions here, and, and we can talk about that in more detail. I'm seeing here from one of the comments, Good Sabretooth is an Age of Apocalypse only creation. Uh, yeah, I guess Age of I, I am, because I like Age of Apocalypse so much, and it's an alternate reality, I'm definitely more amenable to that version of, of heroic Sabretooth. That works a lot better for me. Actually, kind of in, ironically, in Exiles, which is, um, you know, the original Exiles series in Marvel launched in the 2000s. And that was an alternate reality hopping book as well. This book plays off that name, clearly, you know, with Sabretooth and the Exiles, but so far is not doing any of the multiverse alternate reality hopping stuff. It doesn't feel like it's going to. I mean, certainly nothing about it in this first issue suggests that it's actually going to do that. I would still love that. I mean, I would still be head over heels for like this team exactly as it is exploring variations of Krakoa in the, throughout the multiverse. I think that's a huge opportunity in the X office right now. Um, but I don't think it's going to happen in this book, but yeah, I mean, I think otherwise you're right. I do like that, that version of Sabretooth and it works for me. And again, it's like, you don't have to, in an alternate reality, I don't have to apply the same character baggage necessarily that I know about in Earth 616. Um, let's see, Bernard asks here, do you think Birdie's going to show up? Uh, I think Birdie was teased at the very end of the five issue Sabretooth series. So it seems pretty likely. It seems pretty likely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would put my bets on that for sure. Question here from Banksy. This mini is only five issues, right? Yeah, this one's five. It's been promoted as five issues, just like the first. 
Um, and then I think it's it was initially announced as what was called a trip hike. Um, or tr- yeah, I'll, we'll say it that way. Sure. <laughs> uh, so I'm I'm picturing three five issue minis in total in the Sabretooth saga. You know, so that's where we would get the X Pats as teased earlier uh, in the comments here, which is which is pretty smart. Pretty smart. I would enjoy that. Uh, okay. It's a good series. I recommend checking it out. I'm teasing the idea of digging in more heartily and doing a full series review of the first Sabretooth prior to this interview, but we'll see if that actually comes to fruition. Um, I got a lot of comics to read. I got a lot. And like I said, Dancing with Stars. It's such a long show. <laughs> Where does one find the time for other things? Uh, okay, so let's talk about Judgment Day Omega next. This is the book written by Kieran Gillen. This is the final bookend on the Judgment Day event, which, again, I've talked about as definitely one of the best events in recent years in Marvel Comics and Big Two Comics, really. Um, it is one, probably one of my top ten Marvel events of all time. Uh, but, again, last time we tried to do that list, it got, like, complicated. <laughs> but it's probably in the top ten. It's really good. It's a really effective event. The outcomes, the outcomes of the event, which are kind of summarized and teased up again here in Omega, Cersei is killed, Okay. Ajak is given the powers of the progenitor and gives a face to the celestials. Is now going by Ajak Celestia. Okay, so we have an eternal made celestial. Zurus is back to leading the Eternals. The X-Men are now sharing resurrection with some worthy humans. A worthy in quotes there, because how do you define that? Eros has been made Pope Minister of Change, which is a cool title, and uh, Druig has been excluded in the pen with Uranos. So hard times, hard times for Druig. Um, as you can tell from that list of outcomes, like it's 95% Eternals focused, right? I guess the other one is the Iraqi, aka the Mutants of Mars, can use the weapons of Uranos, um, but that also necessitates the freedom of Uranos for one hour. So they get, the Eternals have promised them the one-hour Uranus devastation package. Um, which I feel like the Iraqi would rather be like, like instead of being using that strategically and being like, okay, Krakoa, here you go, use it on the vault or whatever, I feel like they'd rather be like, cool, give us Uranus for an hour, we want to fight him. <laughs> which is probably a bad idea, you know, but that does, that feels more like the thing they'd want to do. But that that's out there. That's going to happen in X-Men Red at some point, right? It's definitely going to come. Um, but those are the outcomes, right? And it's super Eternals-focused. I think Omega functions primarily as, like, what feels to me like Gillen's final, you know, send-off for his Eternals run, which, again, is amazing. <laughs> like, it's so good, and it's also such a high degree of dif- dif- difficulty to make the Eternals that cool. Nobody had ever done it before. You know? Shouts to King Kirby. Nobody had ever done it before. Um, So yeah, I mean, it's kind of a a victory send-off, I think, for the Eternals. I mean, there's no follow-up series announced at this point. Uh, I wondered, you know, okay, would Gillen return to this for like a season two? It doesn't feel like that. I mean, it feels like a all the toys are going back in the box kind of thing. I would actually say to its detriment in some ways, right? Like, I think this Omega issue... It feels a little too much, like a little too meticulously and almost like breaking the fourth wall, like putting everything back in its right place, you know, a little radio heady, everything in its right place. And that's kind of disappointing. I mean, on one hand, I get it, you know, like if Grant Morrison famously ends runs with like very difficult to pick up pieces, (laughs) you know, and, uh, and Morrison stuff is obviously celebrated by the fans, but, like, for the people who come after you, the writers and the creators, like, that's not necessarily, like, I don't know, it's like going to a restaurant, like, leaving your table messy, <laughs> right? Like, just, like, leave things better than you found them. Um, but it feels very, I don't know, kind of pristine and just, like, okay, everything's going back in the box. Uh, the world knows about eternal resurrection now, so if one of them dies, a human dies, everybody knows that. But also the Eternals are going to be kind of just walking among the humans, doing their thing. Like, it sets up a premise for what a future Eternal series could look like. They're, you know, on treaty ground now with the mutants and everything. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. Like, I I don't, I actually don't think it puts them in, like, a clearly more interesting position, which is 
partly Gillen's fault for doing such a good job making them interesting in the first place. You know, uh, it's kind of a catch-22. Uh, they do have some interesting, at least, debates now, potentially, between what is the Eternal's purpose. Uh, they have their three rules that Gillen established, but then you have Ajax now as a Celestial saying, you know, here's some reinterpretations of those, of how the Eternals can actually change, because that's been their whole big thing. It's like, can these people change? Can they do something different? And that's what Judgment Day ultimately builds to. That's what gets Cersei killed, is she changes. She proves that she can. That's what saves the world actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is, that is most of what happens here. Uh, Gillen is very much on his Wick Div with Ajak, you know, I think on, on Wicked and Divine series, like it's, you know, looking at what is it like for a person to be made a god, in this case, for an Eternal to be made a god. What does that mean? What would you do with that power? You know, these sorts of things. Um, you know what? Actually, the biggest drop in this whole issue to me, and I don't know if this should have felt like as big of a drop, uh, or not, so y'all can tell me. So it's revealed here that Krakoa is as old as the Celestials' visit to create the Eternals. So like billions of years ago, the Celestials come to Earth, they create the Eternals and the Deviants. I can make an argument that they technically created the mutants then, but that's not the point. Okay, they then look to the Earth to be like, we need a system at the center of the Earth. And that's what the machine becomes. That's that's what the machine becomes, um, which has been a like the narrator, the character throughout the Eternals run and, and through Judgment Day to a part. But what they what Fasto shares with Krakoa here is the machine left a note for Krakoa because when the when the Celestials went to put the machine in the Earth, there was already essentially an island, Krakoa or I guess Arako maybe. I guess it would have been Iraq. No, no, not Iraq. What was it? Uh, Okara. Maybe it's Okara at that point. Some some facet of Krakoa was already there. So the machine implies that Krakoa and them are related, uh, but the specifications of that relationship are not clear. I need a lot more actual Krakoa stuff. I've been saying it for a long time, but like I am super, super interested in everything to do with this sentient island <laughs> like there's so much history there's so much s secretive sort of just mystery to Krakoa themselves at what point does Krakoa become a bigger part of the story I mean there have been little things here and there like the way that Doug and Krakoa and Warlock are sort of scheming you know as revealed in the pages of Inferno uh Sabretooth plays with that in some interesting ways as well I just I need not a need. <laughs> I don't want to be a child about it. I would love to see more Doug relating to Krakoa and specifically figuring out, like, what is Krakoa's deal? How did Krakoa get here? Like, why did Krakoa actually agree to this beyond just, like, the constant sustenance? There's just so much more to be done with that. I would love to see it. I would love to see it. I don't, like, I don't know that I need a book called Krakoa, but there's there's some way to do it. There's got to be some way to do it. I think that'd be super cool. Um, all right. Give me your questions. Give me your thoughts. I will address what I can here. Take a big old sweet water. I'm seeing a couple comments here. I want the Doug story back. I need more Doug. Um, I agree. Now, I would recommend, folks, if you haven't, Check out the X-Men Unlimited stuff on Marvel Unlimited because there's a really good Doug story by Alex Pachnadal in there. It is not like, you know, the, the kind of thing I'm describing here where it's like big picture sharing a lot of information, but it's just a straight up good Doug Ramsey story. If you're hungry for that, I recommend checking that out. But yeah, I mean, I would love to see a lot more, a lot more about that. All right, what other questions we got? Let's see. If the Okara thing is right, then Eternals are just post-human and mutants in the machine is post krakoa I'll be honest, I don't follow. It would take me a, several minutes of silence <laughs> to piece all that together. Uh, Okara is odd if it is a mutant because it wasn't born from humans. So I figure Okara being actually a deviant. But the Celestials are saying it was already there. 
they're saying it was already there when they got there, right? And deviants were not. So I, I don't think that works, actually. I don't think that works. Um, okay, James says here, today's Wolverine issue really convinced me that we have a dark beast situation. We got a dark beast situation on our hands, everybody. Uh, Wolverine number 27, following hot on the heels of the past issue number 26. It's really good. It's really good. I'm into this Wolverine arc. Uh, Beast is straight up weapon axing Wolverine. There, if you're a mutant or an X-Men and you've been on this team and you know Wolverine and you've, you've shared a beer with this man, there are two things you don't do. Okay, there are two things you don't do. One, drink his beer out of the fridge without asking first. Two, weapon X his ass. Okay, mess with his head. There's no greater crime. No greater crime to do to Wolverine. Beast is straight up doing it. <laughs> it is it is straight up evil, okay? This is the evilest beast, and he's been the worst <laughs> for the duration of the Krakow era. I mean, it is, it is intentional, right? We've talked about this. Like, I am not mad about the positioning of Beast. Am I ready for the return of that character I used to love? Like, yeah, I guess so. But Ben Percy committed to like, hey, this is our director of the CIA, you know what that's going to mean? That's going to mean he's awful. That's going to mean he makes horrific decisions. That's going to mean he completely loses himself in this Krakoa first attitude at the expense of everything and everyone around him, even his allies. Okay? That works for me. Like, like as a, as sort of a, a mutant metaphor, you know, it works for me. And again, it does, it is this thing where it's like, all right, the Krakoa era one of the most interesting things it does is holds a lens to society and says, okay, if we were going to build a new society, what would we do differently? What would we emulate? You know, so to see Krakoa be like, we're going to be better, but also we're just going to have the mutant CIA led by Beast and we're going to give him as much leash as possible and have all these secrets. They're no different. <laughs> they're no different than the history of the world. You know, they're just, Beast is like the person who's like, I'll be that monster if I have to be. And he is. He is that monster, okay? Like, he just, <laughs> like, like there's no version of events where Beast bounces back from any of this without Krakoa, like, like resurrecting him and being like, hey, let's, let's resurrect, uh, uh, you got those memories from back when he was, like, having a brew with Simon Williams and bouncing down the street? Does anybody have the backup of Beast when he was quoting Shakespeare in the 90s? Can we get one of those? Because we can't resurrect this beast as is. Hank McCoy is dead. Hank McCoy is gone. Dark Beast is here. Um, we've known it for a while. I think it's it's just like it's getting even worse. And I, you know what? Like my big critique of the Percy run on X-Force and Wolverine has been show us some cards. Play some cards. You know? You've been holding them for, for three years. Play some cards, please. Wolverine feels like it's doing that. This arc feels like it's doing that with Beast. Things are coming to a head. Um, let's see it. Let's see it get there. You know, let's see it land. But right now, I mean, it's it's going to be hard to like spin your plates, spin your wheels on this one. Um, I'm into this arc. I do think, you know, I, I lump X Force and Wolverine together, and that's intentional. You know, the run is built that way, right? It's interlocking stuff. You really can't read just one without the other in sort of the Percyverse side of Krakoa. Uh, but I do think Wolverine is a lot better generally it will do things that are more interesting when it actually gets like when it gets out of the x-force shadow and kind of just does wolverine stuff it tends to be interesting um and obviously this one is is in the x-force shadow because it's doing a very direct beast story uh there is a mystery here at the very end of this where so beast has like an animal wolverine that he's just sending out on kill missions but then he seems to, he also has a skull locked away in his home. And I, the implication that I got, and somebody tell me here if, there, if there's something else entirely, maybe I just missed it. The implication I got was that's like, that's the actual Wolverine. And what was resurrected is maybe some sort of controllable husk version that is all animal instinct, you know? Because like when Wolverine's resurrected, B steps in like almost immediately and is like, I'll take this one. He puts this weird rething on his, on Wolverine, which seems to calm him down or whatever. Um, so it seems like maybe this isn't like, it's like kind of a clone of Wolverine. You know, that's, that's the impression I got, but I'm curious if, if you all got a different vibe or whatever. 
Um, I'd like to see that. All right, let's see. It will be disappointing if the answer to the B situation is, oh, he just mutated too much and his brain chemistry is off. Uh, yeah, that would be kind of lame. Like there's, and again, like I did a whole video about this early in Crack and Krakoa stuff. Like Beast has been on this trajectory. This is not a shock to the system. This is not character assassination originating here. Beast has been on this road. Okay. Um, if you need, I mean, I guess that's the thing is like at some point, at some point, somebody, some writers, <laughs> some poor soul is probably going to have to step in and try to explain how do we get a Hank McCoy that we like again, you know? Uh, so yeah, like you could step in and get a, oh, it was a, a secondary mutation and it's, it's better now kind of thing. I mean, probably that will happen, but I don't think that will happen here. I don't think that'll happen for a while. Um, let's see. What's wrong with a smart beast who is not nice like Charlie? Not totally sure what you mean because Charlie's not nice either. <laughs> Char Charles Xavier is completely complicit in everything Beast is doing. They are absolutely on the same page. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, that that doesn't quite add up to me. Better than Cat Beast, I'm seeing. How dare you? How dare you come for Cat Beast like this? Probably my favorite Beast. <laughs> no, X Men the animated series Beast. Quote in literature, that's my favorite Beast. Um, as captured by Steve Fox in the recent X-Men 92 stuff. Uh, Cat Beast, a la Morrison and Joss Whedon, new X-Men and then Astonishing X-Men, that's my next favorite beast. And it's close. It's real close. I do like me some Cat Beast. Let's see. Beast hasn't died in the Krakoa area yet, right? Uh, no, I think he has. I think he has, right? What about when those little tiny Russian guys? Or no, I guess maybe they just took out his eye. Unless he got resurrected just with the eye missing? They took out his eye, and uh, and he is missing an eye still, so maybe Beast hasn't died. Is that right? Let's, let's hear it. Has Beast died in the Krakoa era? That's kind of interesting. Not 100% on that. Um, let's see. Bill says, the issue is showing the timeline of how Beast separated Logan's consciousness in the skull from the body, making resurrected Logan more feral. Consciousness. What? <laughs> what? Okay. Uh, if Bishop can be redeemed from killing Charles in Messiah Complex, then anyone can be redeemed, Travis says. Yeah, Bishop had a rough road there for a long while. And kind of, I that is, I don't think it's ever been dealt with in any capacity. <laughs> right? Like in Marauders, the vibe has basically just been, hey, it's Bishop, y'all like him. Let's not ever talk about those, uh, what, five years where he was like one of the biggest villains <laughs> in X-Men, you know? Bishop killed, or seemingly killed, Professor X in Messiah Complex. Okay, it got better. Um, he hunted Cable and Hope Summers when she was perceived as Messiah, like, to the ends of the earth through time. Like, he was, like, a straight-up villain for a while. For a while. And we just don't talk about that. <laughs> so you're right. Eventually, people will just not talk about it. Eventually, people will just be like, I like Beast. Uh, let's let's never talk about that, I mean, at this point, decade of dissent. Okay? Decade of dissent. All right, so we don't know if Beast has ever died, is what I'm seeing here. I'm not seeing any confirmation. Um... Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. All right. Let's, what else do we got? So we just did Wolverine in, in, uh, stellar fashion. Thanks for participating there. Okay. The other, the other issue I thought that was worth talking about today was Legion of X number seven. Whew. Okay. In the past, I have said, I love you, Cy Spurrier, but Legion of X is not working for me at all. I think previously I had said, I'm just done reading it. I'm just not going to bother. That has become a problem <laughs> because within its Byzantine pages, things keep happening and things keep having relevance and Spurrier is a major player in this era and um, Mother Righteous showing up in other books and you kind of have to keep up. Okay, so I'm like, all right, fine. 
I'll keep up. Legion of X does some really interesting things. I still think it is written very, very messily. Okay, and I'm not saying that like there's a lack of care or a lack of thought. I just think the dueling plots generally don't work together. And we've seen, for me at least, you know, and we've seen in this era examples of like dueling, tertiary, quadriary plots. If no one calls me on it, I'm just going to say quadriary and pretend it's a word. All right. And like in New Mutants. I mean, Virayala in the run with Rod Reis, I mean, that was, they had plots on plots on plots. They were doing Claremontian stuff with that. And it was really effective. It really worked. They were generally thematically connection. Legion of X is just like, it is dense. It is dense and heady in ways that I do not think benefit it. Okay? That's the critique. The positive is this issue is fascinating as hell. <laughs> like Spurrier is going in on the phalanx. Okay, going in on the relationship between Warlock, the Technarchy, and the Phalanx. Now, some of this reads like a three-year-old, you know, hey, three years ago recap of Powers of Ten, right? Um, which is disappointing to me that we need that uh, because it's been so sort of slowly ignored for such a long time. I guess life and death's Wolverine semi notwithstanding. But he really gets into it. He really gets into it with Warlock showing up in Legion's astral plane and talking about the Technarchy and talking about the threat they pose and talking about the Phalanx and revealing that he knows the secrets, you know, that the Phalanx created the Technarchy, not the other way around, um, talking about the threat they pose. I mean, there's some really interesting stuff here, too, about like, okay, we know the Phalanx can invade Earth in our realm, but apparently they can also do their Phalanx thing in realms of magic in realms of dream, in metafiction, in one that is redacted? How is it going to get weirder than metafiction in dreams and all that? I have no idea. Like, that was that was really interesting, okay? And then it talks about, like, it talks about Phalanx Ascension, which is that big moment in Powers of Ten where the, the characters in the Powers of Ten 1,000-year timeline are like, all right, we're trying to get to Ascension. And this data page is, is careful to be like, yeah, that doesn't mean you retain some autonomy. Like, you just you just get collected. You just become a part of the phalanx. Like, you don't win in Ascension. It's the vibe I got, at least. But I'm super interested that it's, it's doing anything with this phalanx stuff because no one's touched it yet, really, in any meaningful way. You know, specifically sort of the, the goals of the phalanx and how they're related to these other cosmic entities, the fact that they can get into astral realms. I mean, that is, that's big stuff. Um, so I'm really curious to see how that plays out. You know, it was definitely like I was, my eyebrows raised. I got excited. I really focused in on what was being said there. You know, uh, Banksy asks here, have you caught up on previous Legion of X or did you just start reading again from the tie-in? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm caught up at this point. Like I didn't reread it and I definitely, the first few issues because I was not into it, you know, there's stuff that I'm like fuzzy on, I suppose. Um, but I mean, I think I've read every issue at this point. I don't think there's anything I skipped. Uh, I, I mean, I think as a series, like, it has kind of abandoned its premise, and I actually think that's a good thing, because I think that was one of the weakest elements. Like, the idea of Nightcrawler post-establishing his religion, creating the Legionnaires and being this new Krakoan police, but we don't call us call ourselves police thing, like, that was not working, I don't think. And now it's just become mostly a Legion book, mostly about his astral plane, but then also just like, and also Nightcrawler's a character in this book, we're going to do a thing where he's got horns. <laughs> like, and that's interesting. I mean, all the interactions between Mr. Sinister and Dr. Nemesis as rival scientists and geneticists in this book were absolute gold. Absolute gold. Mr. Sinister and Nightcrawler stuff, I mean, that was excellent, you know? So Nightcrawler's thing here is he's just got devil horns now, and nobody knows how they got there. There's some sort of magic mutation thing going on. The very end of this issue uh, it reveals that apparently it happened to Angel too. So it's it's not just Nightcrawler. Um, but they're trying to figure out that mystery. It's hard not to think of the Draco, which is the infamous Chuck Austin written Uncanny X-Men series in the you know early to mid-aughts where it was revealed that Nightcrawler was the son of a devil and mystique. 
Um, that's another one where we, you know, we don't, we don't talk about that one. <laughs> we don't talk about Draco, no, no, no. All right, we, <laughs> we can bust that out every time Draco comes up. But uh, it brings those vibes back. Could Spurrier actually do something with that in interesting ways? Uh, it'd be kind of fun. It'd be engaged. You know, I mean, hey, I'm here for the X office, like engaging with X-Men continuity in, in some fun and progressive ways. Um, cause I kind of think that has been a miss in this era, I think. Uh, but yeah, that's what's going on. Legion of X. It's compelling. I really like the Titan issues previously here with Uranus and Legion stuff. So I'm, I'm tentatively back in, I'm tentatively back in on Legion of X. Again, it's a book I critique, but it's like, there's enough big, wild, interesting stuff going on here that I'm invested in seeing what happens. All right. Uh, all right. Let's see. Let's see what's going on here. Uh, Braden says, I actually love the dueling plots with what Psy is doing. Sure. Sure. I can feel that. Um, Redeem Moira. We're not going to talk about that. I wish Marvel would be more careless with how old this or is this mutant. Uh, I'm assuming you mean more careful. I honestly, no, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. Uh, okay, so actually feels like Krakoan era is starting to move forward again. Um, yeah, I think the Destiny of X has generally held forward momentum. You know, I think the the challenge has been it's doing it kind of one book at a time as opposed to all the books in concert. But I do think there's a forward momentum with the X-Men books right now. And it's all going to Sins of Sinister, which feels like it's actually building up based on something that was kind of one of the bigger teases of this era. We got a Fall of X thing coming, which kind of promises and teases some bigger stuff there as well, you know, in terms of Fallout. So I, I do feel like we're going places, um, which obviously the biggest problem with this whole Krakoan experiment has been the moments where it's like, okay, this book's fine, but we're not going anywhere. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really feel that right now. Let's see. When are they going to cancel Marauders? Jesse asks. Oh, oh, that's tough. Shots fired at Marauders. I mean, that book's not working for me. I definitely fully have to admit that. Um, this era hasn't really canceled almost anything. You know, I mean, again, because the X era has been doing so well, obviously Fallen Angels, I don't know if that was always going to be a five issue mini, but certainly after like one issue, <laughs> it was a lock that it would be. Same with X Corps. I don't know if that was always for sure five issues. Um, probably should have been shortened to one or two. Uh, Marauders is not my fave. Um, cancellation is, is harsh in this era, though. Again, it seems like most of these creators get a chance. I like generally the character interactions and in theory i've liked some of the ideas and the premises uh but it is it is definitely lower on my totem pole right now um i i can't i can't really fight back on that one i would love to be able to because again like sea has written awesome comics a lot of stuff i love uh but but this one is not really clicking either uh in i don't i i think the parts in marauders that i do tune in for are basically any time Cassandra Nova speaking. Like any Cassandra Nova moments, my ears perk up and everything else, I'm kind of like, ooh, I don't know. Kind of where I'm at. Let's see, Nick D had a comment here in the Super Chat. Thanks so much, Nick D. Uh, watching from the beginning, so I'm a bit behind. Venom is my favorite character. This new Venom run is weird. I also hate the way Eddie Brock is drawn. The rest of the art is great. I just don't like how Eddie looks. Yeah, Ryan Stegman set the bar pretty high with his Eddie. I did really like his Eddie and his Venom. Uh, it is. It's a super weird run. I mean, truly. It's strange. I think Venom needs some strangeness after the Kate Stegman era, which was kind of like the classic platonic ideal of what a Venom run could be, I think, in a lot of ways. I think getting weird after that makes sense, um, but it's not a weirdness that has quite grabbed me in the right ways. Um, I like I like it when Marvel books get strange and do surprising things. But yeah, I'm, I'm having a similar reaction, I have to say. 
Um, was Children of the Atom canceled, or was it supposed to be that length? That's another one. I At this point, I can't remember. No, Excal I'm seeing Excalibur was canceled, too. No, Excalibur was never canceled. Um, Excalibur ran 30 flipping issues, and then it reset when everything else reset, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I don't know about... It's hard, like, the only books that have been short in the X-Office, I guess let's say that, the only books that have been short would be Children of the Atom, x Core, and, or x Corps and, uh, what am I blanking on now? Uh, oh, Fallen Angels, right? I would guess the only one of those that got axed. I don't know. I don't know. Why am I projecting that? I have no idea. Uh, Pioneers asks, any leads on setting up an interview with Jonathan Hickman? Um, I have made some outreach and I have had no inreach. <laughs> so no, uh, if anyone has a usable email, pitch me in secret. <laughs> and I will happily request a little Three Moons, Three Worlds conversation. But in the meantime, no. Let's see. All right, get any questions, get any thoughts. I think we're, we're past time. Good gravy. Um, if you have any questions for me, for Victor Laval, for Kieran Gillen, get those in. Again, I'll try to, you can always like tweet them at me or whatever too. Uh, my final thought here is I'm obsessed with Marvel Snap now. <laughs> it's an app. Uh, it's a free card game. It's got Marvel characters on the cards and they all have different powers and I'm obsessed. So if you need just like, if, you, if your life is too open, and you need some time distractions, grab that Marvel Snap and let me know what you think because I'm having a blast with this card game. It's very fun. Very fun. And it's getting my kids uh, into things like Devil Dinosaur. So that's that's been awesome, right? You have not lived until you've had your five-year-old and three-year-old screaming devil at each other um, and then roaring loudly at each other at the park, <laughs> at a public park, right? Your life is lacking until you've had those moments, okay? I'm seeing here from JJ says, I read an article on CBR talking about the 10 signs Marvel is running out of steam today. It made me sad. <laughs> CBR is custom made to make you sad. Uh, that <laughs> they traffic for years in anger and sadness and rage and all the way to the bank for those at the top, but sadly not for those writing those, those sad little articles because they do not pay even as well as Comic Book Herald. That has always been my bar for CBH uh, for the past you know, five years that I've had freelancers is I will pay CBR or better, okay? With my little site <laughs> that is nowhere near in size or stature to CBR, I will pay better than them. Uh, and I have continued to do that. But yeah, I mean, I, I have no interest in that kind of article from that source. Uh, there are individuals who could write great commentary on that that I would be interested in reading. But yeah, I don't know. Like, is that a is that a movie thing? Is that a comics thing? It doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, I do think if you're just looking at the comic side and you're looking at, is Marvel Comics running out of steam? Um, they're not at their highest point. That's for sure. You know, there's a lot of good, but maybe few great books right now, I think, for Marvel. Um, they are, I mean, they are five years into quote unquote Marvel fresh start. <laughs> it is no longer fresh. It is no longer a start, you know? So I think that's kind of what I'm talking about in terms of like, okay, what is the core then of the universe and what is everything kind of building towards and playing with? And it's all the X-Men stuff. Um, and that's kind of what everything is going towards. But I mean, I think if you're just looking at like cream of the crop stuff, a lot of it's X related. Mortal X-Men, X-Men Red, Chief Among Them, the Sabretooth Saga, I think has been very, very good. New Mutants is in a turnover period. Um, outside of that, though, I mean, I really like Moon Knight. I like the Jeb, I like pretty much anything Jeb McKay's touching, I tend to like. Moon Knight, I think Strange has actually been really interesting. Um, but they, I think they, they need a boost. They need kind of a turn. Fantastic Four, obviously, a new number one today. Maybe that'll get there. Avengers needs a kick in the pants and creative turnover. Um, Amazing Spider-Man needs a little push, a little push as well. So yeah, I mean, some of the franchises are in need of a boost. Um, and you did have, I mean, this past year, we had the end of a lot of really good stuff, right? Like you had Immortal X-Men in, or not Immortal X-Men, Immortal Hulk. You had uh, the, the Kate Stegman Venom. 
you had Tiny East Coats, you know, Black Panther, stuff like that, you know, things that had been running for a long time that were pretty good. Um, so yeah, there's definitely not, this is definitely not like peak era Marvel for me, but there's a decent chunk of solid stuff. So I don't know, running out of steam is a, like, that implies that they were like at the peak of their powers, you know, which I wouldn't really have said either. All right, let's see, what else do we got? CBH is greater than CBR, thank you very much. Thank you very much, appreciate it. If you could only get one of the upcoming Omnibus, which would it be, Immortal Hulk or Coates or Kate's Ven Omnibus, which includes Absolute Carnage, King Black, etc., that is going to be the final question that I take. And it is the easiest question I will answer all night. Immortal Hulk by Miles. Miles upon miles upon miles. I like Kate's and Stegman Venom. First half especially. Um, the first issue of Absolute Carnage rules. King of Black is fine. Mortal Hulk is an all-time great Marvel run. All-time. Uh, I would take that one for sure. Can you give me an X-Men overview projection? That's a, that's a big ask. Maybe we can talk about that next week. Um, and, okay, final, final thought here from JJ. R.I.P. Carlos Pacheco. Uh, yeah, I saw the news this morning that that was... That was likely. Uh, Carlos Pacheco is a fabulous artist. Did some awesome stuff on Fantastic Four. Avengers Forever might be the biggest book. Um, fantastic. Fantastic artist. And yeah, thoughts and prayers to the family there. That is definitely, definitely too bad. So we'll go out on that side note. Thanks everybody for joining. I'll be back next week um, if the comics are good. Thanks for joining. Appreciate you all being here. And enjoy the comics. <laughs>